see you. You have come for week 10 or 11, I can't count, of uh, spiritual warfare, the unseen realm, and Penny Langston. Uh, I don't have a whole lot to start you with today. I want to jump right in. Uh, I want to deal with a couple of the objections that I haven't really dealt with head on yet. Uh, these are a couple of things that sometimes we say. Uh, and because I know the background where a lot of us have come from and the things that we have heard taught, et cetera, over the years, uh, I want to just, I want to answer a question I haven't heard you ask yet, but it's maybe uh, floating around in the background. One of the things that I always heard when we talked about anything at all supernatural, miracles, angels, demons, anything really, was some version of this. That was then, this is now. Have you heard some version of that? Um, and kind of the short version of that is uh, if the, you know, the miraculous gifts and supernatural occurrences were limited to the time of the life of Christ and the apostles and the people on whom the apostles laid their hands. And there's some bit of that that is logical and helpful and true. There is a sense where in the New Testament, it looks like Drew is one of the apostles, just, mm, I think he's Thaddeus. Uh, and uh, Drew decides to lay his hands on Jennifer, not like that, but like you know, the other way, uh, and give her this spiritual gift. Jennifer was not then able in Scripture, as far as I can tell, to pass that gift on to Penny. Jennifer could still do cool stuff. And so one of the arguments you heard in the church was, once all of the Jennifers were dead, spiritual gifts ended completely. I give that a solid, yeah, but. <laughs> Is that an okay answer for me to give that? Yeah, but. That, that chain of events appears to be true to me in Scripture. But don't mistake the ability of an apostle to delegate another person with these miraculous gifts ending. Don't, don't conflate that with the ending of God's activity in the world. That's where we made the mistake. Does that make sense? Okay, can God still do stuff? Go like this very vigorously. In fact, try to give yourself a head injury while you do it, because God can still do stuff. Does God still do stuff? Go like this, vigorously, because if your answer is not this, stop praying. Your praying is pointless, okay? Uh, your prayer... Now, some of you are saying, well, God's sovereign, God knows the future, your prayers are pointless anyway, but that's another class. So, yeah, you know, uh, well, we're not fully all that Calvinist anyway. Uh, but there is, there is something to that story of this is how gifts were passed, but does that mean there are no longer any gifts whatsoever? Be really careful before you go all the way down that road. I think that's a dangerous road to go too far down. Drew? Drew called it the end of discretionary gifts, the end of the ability for a person to pass a gift to another person. I, I, I like that language a little bit better. Um, so do some things look different after the first century? Well, I, I think that's fair. I really do. Do some things even look different now that we have the gift of the canon of Scripture? Well, again, we have different needs. But did things look different in the Civil War than they do today? God always works in the times and places, and so it's true of the devil too, I think. So I, I want to kind of lay this foundation for you. I, let me give my two or three snarky lines. I have been bothered for a lot of years how in the church people are scared to talk about the Holy Spirit. Um, and I have said time and time again that a lot of people I know in Churches of Christ are functionally two-thirds of an atheist. They believe in the Father and the Son, but not the Spirit. Or they are so convinced that everything special stopped happening that God is no longer involved in the world. I know a lot of people in our brotherhood who are effectively deists. They believe God wound up the world, took out the key, and we're just waiting for it to wind down. Those are both heresies. Uh, but they are heresies that are common in churches of Christ. I'm not bashing us. I love us. I'm here on purpose. But there's some places that we have been taught wrong, I think, and it has some damage that it's continuing to do, and we need to unlearn some of the things that we learned. Side note to the side note to the side note. There's a term that's really common right now. You're hearing it if you read anything in the religious circles. It's called about deconstruction. 
a lot of people are deconstructing their faith. You can kind of figure out what that term means, right? They're kind of tearing apart what's broken and wrong with it. And there are a couple of versions of that that I want to talk to you about for just a second. It is uh, an entirely reasonable thing for you to question what you were taught growing up. Some of it was good, some of it wasn't. You know how I know that? People taught you. So some of the stuff they said was true and some of it wasn't. Um, There is a trend in culture right now where it seems like people deconstruct everything and end up with a pile of rubble. One of the reasons that you hear me sometimes say things critical about what we have been taught and what I grew up with is I want you to know that it's okay to question what I teach, what you have been taught, and I don't want you to make the mistake of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Does that make sense? It's okay to challenge the status quo. I just don't want you to give up on what matters most. Deconstruct what needs deconstructing, but keep a foundation that you can build on top of. That's what I'm trying to say. Let me say another couple things before I dig into class today, too. Uh, Talking about the Spirit, talking about spiritual gifts, talking about supernatural occurrences. One thing that is really problematic about this discussion is there are such a wide spectrum of views, and people do some really wacky stuff with it. It makes it really easy to caricature different positions and not respond to the real position, but to do the straw man thing. So there is a guy in the Dixon Ministry Fellowship. Uh, the Dixon, there's a Dixon area preachers meeting, and let's just hope none of them ever find this podcast, because I'm about to tell you the truth. Um, half of them are crazy. <laughs> and I might even mean that medically. <laughs> like, uh, one time we had a, a ministry meeting, it was after one of the school shootings, and they invited uh, the school board to come and present about school safety. I think the theory was so that we would know what to pray for, whatever. Um, so the guy from the school board comes and he talks about, you know, they're adding SROs, and that was when they were adding the checkpoint to Dixon County High School and all, you know, here's what all we're doing. So they field all these questions, you know, well, why don't we put 10 officers in every school? And the guy's like, you you know what that's going to cost? You know, another guy's like, why don't we put a VFW branch in every school? That way all the old vets will sit around with their guns. Like nothing could possibly go wrong there. You know, another guy's like, hey, let's give all the teachers guns. And I'm like, you won't even give them pencils. Why do I think you're going to buy them ammo? Like, you know, and there's just all of these conversations that are left, right, and middle. I kid you not, a minister in the town of Dixon said, well, have you guys considered putting a gun robot in every classroom so that way if there's a, uh, an active shooter, the principal can turn a key and it'll just kill him? <laughs> so I had about five seconds of awkward silence and then I burst out laughing <laughs> because that still holds the record for stupidest thing I have ever heard in my life. For one, have you seen any of the Terminator movies? Like, that's how they start, okay? For two, are, are you going to go to Radio Shack and buy, can I get the Gun Robot 9000, please? Like, you know, like, where, where does this come from? Like, okay, I know, I know, let's put poison gas in the rooms and tell the kids to hold their breath during an active shooter drill. This is just stupid. And a guy sitting next to me goes, that's a pretty good idea. And I thought, I am never going to this guy's church ever, <laughs> you know? Uh, so uh, when I say that there's some crazy people in religion, there's some crazy people in religion. There was a meeting, and it was probably the second or third I'd ever been to. And a Church of Christ guy showing up at the Ministry Alliance is sort of like... Anybody want to finish this metaphor for me? Because I don't really have anything good. Uh, let's just go unicorn, okay? <laughs> it's a little bit unusual. And so this guy, it's a meeting, it's at the nursing home, and he hears that the Church of Christ guy's here, and he is, um, he's an independent, kind of off the far end of Pentecostal. Like, if he handled snakes, I wouldn't be surprised, okay? Uh, he hears that the Church of Christ guys, he interrupts the meeting, and he pulls from his coveralls, I just want you to get the image right in your head, a cassette tape out of the pocket that he's carrying with him at all times, evidently, He marches across the room to interrupt the meeting and hands me this cassette tape. He says, Brother, the Holy Spirit told me you needed to hear this sermon of mine about the Spirit. And with every fiber of my being, I quashed my reply, which was, it's a crying shame. The Holy Spirit didn't tell you I don't own a cassette player anymore. (laughs) Like, buddy, the Holy Spirit didn't tell you that one. 
I'm not saying the Holy Spirit can't prompt a person and nudge a person and help a person. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going all the way over here. But that guy, I'm going to tell you, it was obvious from the way he talked and walked and acted, he was looking forward to his chance to show a Church of Christ preacher what was really right. That was the, and I know that from the conversations we had afterwards. That wasn't a Holy Spirit thing. It was a crazy person thing. But because you and I have seen some of the crazy person things, it makes it really easy for us to run all the way over here and not touch any of those things. So I grew up being taught not to use the language, God put it on my heart. Um, because, well, sometimes it's hard to tell. Did God put it on my heart? Or did my belly put it on my heart? <laughs> or is this just what I want? And, and that's something that you have to pay attention to. There's a reason the Bible tells you in 1 John to discern the spirits, test the spirits, see whether they're from God. Can God put things on Matthew's heart? I certainly believe He can and does. I also believe that I have a responsibility to be discerning and careful to make sure I know what God put on my heart versus what Matthew just wanted to do. So sometimes I'll tell you the truth. Even there are some places and times where I am really convinced of a thing, but I don't say it, and perhaps I should say it because I don't want to make that guy's mistake. Do you hear how I've overcorrected? So that's one of the issues we're fighting within this whole thing. Uh, by the way, here's the short answer to this. Remember that the New Testament viewed all time after the ascension of Christ as the last days. All of those verses describe the moment after the ascension to the return of Jesus as the last time. Are we living in the last days? Well, the Bible says yes. Were we a thousand years ago? Yes. Will we be next week if Jesus hasn't come back? Yes. If Jesus doesn't come back for 10,000 more years, this will still have been the last days in the language of Scripture. That's the way the Bible describes it, okay? That's just what it is. Nothing in Scripture suggests that there is a dramatic change of how things happen in this epoch. This is one unit of time in the Bible's worldview, the time between the, re the ascension and the parousia, the coming of Christ. So that's another kind of answer to this question. Let me show you a couple other things. This is a verse that I also heard a lot growing up. This is 1 Corinthians 13. And this was the verse that was attempting to prove that all of this stuff is done for, right? Uh, and, and, you know, this is the love chapter. Love never ends, but prophecy, it ends. Tongues, they end. Okay, so th there is an idea here about some things last and some things don't last. But I want to make sure you see what the verse does and doesn't say. Y you see this piece in the middle? We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes... The partial will pass away. Have, have you heard this text? Have you heard this lesson? You've heard 1 Corinthians 13. Everybody's heard 1 Corinthians 13. So the question is, what is this perfect that's coming, and what's the partial that's going away? Now, there's about three answers that have been given to this question. And the answer that I got growing up was that the perfect was the completion of the New Testament. Um, when God's Word is complete, the canon is closed, and we have all of the revelation we need, um, that's when all this other stuff goes away. And they would appeal to James 1.25, which calls Scripture the perfect law. That's the only place that you have the word perfect in the New Testament associated with God's words at all. Um, but the issue with this is you read this passage, um, you're in 1 Corinthians. We haven't discussed the text of Scripture once anywhere in the book of 1 Corinthians. That, that's not a concept that's anywhere in there. Now, there is a concept of something coming that does away for the need of prophecy, and, uh, but, okay, that third point underneath here should catch your attention. This interpretation of 1 Corinthians 13 appears nowhere in church history until the 1800s. Do you know what I call a doctrine that I don't see until 1800 years after Jesus? Garbage is the word I usually call a doctrine. That, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. You should be very suspicious of any teacher or preacher or author or scholar who comes around and says, I am the first person in 2,000 years who has ever understood this verse correctly. Okay, could they be right? It's possible, 
but you're really going to have to sell me on it if you're the first person who's come up with this idea in 2,000 years of history. So that's, I'm swimming upstream on this one a little bit. Okay, so here's the next answer that some people give to what this perfect thing is in 1 Corinthians 13. Some people say, well, the perfect is love. Okay, at first blush, that kind of makes sense because what's 1 Corinthians 13 about? Love, which appears to be the thing that's missing in Corinth. You remember we have all of these divisions. We don't love each other enough to deal with sin. Um, And so maybe the idea is that once love has matured and Corinth solves all of its problems about division and fussing and fighting and incest and all that other fun stuff, they won't need prophecy and knowledge anymore. Question, when does a church reach a perfection of love? you ever met one that's done that? So this answer is a little bit nonsensical to me because you're describing a scenario that doesn't ever happen. Do you see the problem with that logic? Uh, Now, to be fair, this view shows up frequently, not all the time. It doesn't dominate the conversation, but it shows up a fair bit in church history over the years. And you see how you get there. Again, 1 Corinthians 13 is the love chapter. Love is the thing you need. 1 Corinthians 14 verse 1 says, pursue love. You've got it written all over this. So that has the benefit of at least having some contextual connection to 1 Corinthians 13. But it also has the problem of, does it work? It doesn't quite work. Here's view number three, and this is, full disclosure, my view. Uh, 1 Corinthians 13 may be the perfect is describing, I don't know, the only one who has ever been perfect. The one who on the cross said, it is finished. By the way, the word finished in the Greek in that language is perfect. It is perfected. It is completed. He is the one who is making perfect his creation. I think this is talking about the coming of Christ. When Christ comes, you won't need prophecy anymore. You won't need knowledge anymore. Well, why won't you need prophecy when Christ comes? Well, duh, he's right there. It kind of makes sense in that passage, doesn't it? Um, And it has a couple of nice little perks going for it. This is the view that dominated church history from 0 to 1600. That that checks a nice box for me. And it connects connects contextually to what happens in 1 Corinthians. Do you remember what 1 Corinthians 15 is about? It's about the resurrection and the coming of Christ. Oh, huh. So that actually is right in line with the stream of where the book goes. Are you following me? Is this, this rant kind of making some sense? So I'm not trying to tell you that the church you grew up got everything wrong and they're stupid and they're bad. And if you disagree with me today, congratulations. You're wrong, but I still like you. Uh, it, it's going to be all right. I may be wrong about this too. And in 10 years, I may change my position again uh, because I have held all three of these positions. I'm just telling you the one that I am at today. So that is what it is. But what's significant to me about that is, with that in mind, this passage no longer reads as a all supernatural stuff ends in some magical year that we're not real sure when. It reads is until Christ returns. It will end. The passage is telling you the truth, but it doesn't work the way I thought it worked. Okay, I'm going to throw that back on the screen. Questions, comments, whatever I'm trying to say. What you want to say? You know, there's a certain symmetry, it seems like. Um, I have a lot of good evidence for God's activity hasn't ceased and the devil's activity hasn't ceased. Yeah, yeah, good point. What else? Yeah. The teaching I had growing up, yeah. The Holy Spirit was basically the words of Scripture, no more, no less. Was that the version you guys got? Anybody else get that?
Yeah. More perfect thing. <laughs> you like that? So what do you do then? And then at the end, those first grades and everything, you said they're solid child and act like child. Well, when I matured, put away those things. When I matured, I put it away and started studying the world for me. I started studying about the Spirit. And you can't do away with the Spirit. No. And if you do, you have cut your legs out from underneath you. And I don't, again, I'm not trying to bat. I love where I grew up. I love the people. I love my teachers. I love all that stuff. This is not me. If you hear me bashing them, you're hearing me wrong. I'm not bashing them. I am grateful for what they gave me. In fact, what I'm telling you is I listened to them enough to learn how to study Scripture, even though I came to a different conclusion <laughs> from what they taught me. Uh, this idea is so important to believe and understand that I'm not living this life on the power of Matthew. I can't do it. When you read the fruit of the Spirit, and Al, this is, this is one of Matthew's pet peeves. Uh, I can't tell you how many churches I hear and I see on the signs, they're going to do a summer series about the fruit of the Spirit. And each week is a to-do list sermon. You need to be more loving, love, joy, peace, patience. You need to do these things. Okay, uh, what produces an apple? Anybody know? A seed, on, and a seed grows into a tree. An apple tree produces an apple. Where do you get oranges? So the fruit of an orange tree is an orange. The fruit of the Spirit, what produces the Spirit's fruit? The Spirit. Well, I thought I had to do it. <laughs> you know, we do. If you miss that, the fruit of the Spirit actually becomes one more burden on you that you will not be able to. Man, I'm not loving enough. I'm not patient enough. I'm not peaceful enough. But if you understand what Al just talked about, that the Spirit who raised Christ from the dead is at work within you. This does not turn you into a tongue-speaking Pentecostal. It turns you into the image of Jesus who is at work in you. Do you all know why James is a good, good, good dude? It's not his parents. It's not Harriet. It's the Spirit of God who's at work in him. And he would tell you that. Okay? Steve, I put you off for a minute. Well, I think you can make a strong argument that all of us in this room are gifted. Hmm. God has given gifts equally to this church, mm -hmm. or to whatever the needs are. Um, not a second token, because we've argued so much about it. Very few of us, I would suspect you, can identify their giftedness. Yes. And I think we've done probably not a real good job helping one another to discern those gifts. Yes. So we stay confused, afraid to do anything, lest we violate whatever. What? So I think we could go back or start doing better jobs identifying our giftedness. Steve, I know your wife won't sit near you today. No, we have to argue. Uh, well, that's all right. She's right. You need to repent. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> My success rates are abysmal. But Jane and I were talking, just a second, uh, Jane and I were talking a little bit before class about even the concept of a call to ministry. If you don't have some room in your, your theology for God at work in you, you're not going to have room for a call to ministry. You're not going to have room to recognize that you have whether you want to use the words gifts, talents, abilities, recognize that the Bible te teaches that whatever we have is a gift from God. Everything we have is a gift from God. So if you are a good public speaker, you're not a good public speaker. God has given you the gift of doing that. If you are a good communicator, if you are a good man, can we just take a moment to appreciate how bad our kids' education program would be if I were in charge of the nursery? Hey, there you go. I mean, I'm thinking barbed wire around the door, broken glass to keep the little, little ankle biters from escaping. That's not the giftedness God has given me. God has given me a weird set of gifts. I'm weird, and I know it, but I want to use my weird for Him. All right, Liz, just one second. Gieber's first. So, traditionally, because I, I, I know where you come from, yeah. um, my thinking or my understanding is the Spirit, what's the unforgivable sin? The, the blasphemy and spirit text. And, uh, and so because of that, because we don't want to offend the spirit, we don't really talk about it. Because we don't want to be like the other denominations. We don't want to be Pentecostal families. We don't want to accidentally do something to a 
offend the Spirit. Yeah. But you can't discern it if you don't identify it. Yeah, the irony is, how offensive would it be if I were in your house and you never acknowledged me ever? You want to talk about offending the Spirit? <laughs> yeah. You get how offensive that probably is to the Spirit? He's here. Hey, don't talk about him. He's kind of weird and he makes me feel uncomfortable. <laughs> Now, I don't think that's the same thing as blaspheming the Spirit, to be very clear. But I do think it's the exact same thing as Paul's warning in Thessalonians, don't quench the Spirit. Um, I think in a lot of churches we have taken a giant fire extinguisher and sprayed it all over the Spirit. Okay, uh, Liz, you're up. Well, that's more of a question. Shoot. <laughs> um, you said something about God put it on my heart, you, that you were brought up not yeah. That phrase. And I too mm-hmm. uh, have just more recently than anything have been around in, in, in mixed company and had like actual real conversations with people who are more comfortable mm-hmm. with using such language. But do you, I mean, does it go back to all of this as to why that, that is, there's kind of an adversity to that? Or do you think that it's changed now and do you use that terminology now? Or what, what, what would you think? That's a really fun set of questions. Um, by nature, I still, not, I still personally don't say it much because my nature is I want to be very careful about saying something that's not of God and claiming it's from God because I've seen a lot of people be manipulative and dishonest doing that. I suspect, Liz, that I am unhealthy in my avoidance of that phrase. Can I just, does that description make sense to you? I think it's a beautiful and appropriate thing to say when it's true and helpful and right. And there are some times in my life, Jane and I were talking about this before class, where there is a certainty of this is what's going on. I wish some of my friends in other groups would be more careful. Again, I'm going to tell you a Dixon Ministry Fellowship story because it's easy. I'll get you in just a second, Jim. Uh, But in this meeting, this one guy gets up and he announces, that we're going to have this revival meeting in Dixon, and he thinks 30 or 40 churches are going to come, and we're going to do it at the fairgrounds. We're going to do it the first weekend of August. And, you know, just to demonstrate the unity of churches, each pastor is going to bring whatever sermon they would have preached that Sunday, and they'll just preach them all back to back to back to back. Now, I'm going to wait for just a second while you do the math and you think about this. Um, I might have accidentally muttered out loud, that sounds more like hell than heaven to me. <laughs> And so one of the folks in the room is trying to nudge. He's real, he's real gentle. And he's a good guy. Uh, he says, oh, brother, so what are we going to do about like uh, uh, refreshments for this? Oh, brother, we don't need that. The Word of God's our nourishment. And finally someone says, you want 40 sermons back to back in July on a 100 degree day. Brother, people will die. Like not just leave. D-I-E, Taylor Funeral Home, hole in the ground, Dead. And this guy was saying, God gave me this plan. Now, here's the thing. I absolutely believe the idea that this dream of churches having a unity thing is and can be from God. I believe that. The details about how this was going to work were definitely not from God. Because they were really stupid. And God's not. I'm not being mean to this guy. Well, I am. But I'm not trying to attack his character. I think he was out of balance on that. So Liz, what I'm telling you is, in my, I grew up in the you don't ever say it because we overreacted to guys like this. And I still have some of that in me. I think it would be more appropriate for us to say it more, but to say it wisely. Does that make sense? Okay, Jim, I held you off. I do believe that you can see where the Spirit moved in your life yeah. later. Oh, yeah. I don't know that I can say I see him moving me at the moment. Sometimes that's harder to tell, isn't it? In rear view, it is really easy to see. In the moment, uh, there is some, some ambiguity. But I want to go back to what Jane said. There are, uh, she said it before class, so y'all didn't get to have this fun conversation, sorry. Uh, but there are some moments in, in life that it seems totally unambiguous. Is that fair? Jane, I keep quoting you. Do you want to say something here since I, I'm slandering you left and right? Okay. Um, Teresa. Yeah. That aren't things that are of my thinking. Yeah. So it's easy, it's easy to decipher that for me because I find that it's like, oh, I really don't want to do that. that That's a really good point. Uh, you need to go to that person that you don't even know. Yeah. Like, oh, I really don't want to do that. 
do it. Seriously, how does that even come to mind? So that's a really good point. You know, watch out. When the Spirit is telling you that you really need another Dr. Pepper and Big Mac, that one might not be the Spirit. <laughs> but when the Spirit is telling you to do something, to go back to Al earlier, that is in accordance with Scripture, and what Teresa says is not always what my flesh and heart want to do, that's a really good place to pay a lot of attention. Al? I like the more you eagerly seek to Spirit, hmm. it becomes easier. Yes. Did you hear, Al? The more you eagerly seek the Spirit, the easier the Spirit becomes to discern. Mm -hmm. And how many of you have made that mistake? Oh yeah, I'll do that later. And it's not the same. Remember when our kids don't obey us in the moment, we call it disobedience. But when we do it to God, we just say it's delayed obedience and we play some games. Marsha, then Ryan. Yeah, you are. It's a special moment, and when you experience that, and I appreciate you telling that story, because from where I sit, I can see a lot of faces, and I say, uh, yeah, I have that moment. Ryan, and Steve, uh, Ryan, then Richard. Um, go ahead by what you said, being interrupted, you can feel that presence, so you did the right thing. But, so where do you find this, this fine line? The Bible says, test all the spirits, and the spirits that don't... Uh, say Christ is Lord. Yeah. That Jesus is... Christ and he became so is it just dealing with it's not gonna be limited to just those type of big salvation points. Yeah. How are you going to how does that discernment come in? I mean I think that's a skill that we are learning and working on our whole lives. Yeah. You know, I think that's one of the things the spirit actually helps us do too. The more we are in tune with the real deal, the easier the fake versions are gonna be. But I I, I think so. I think so. Richard. One of the things that's kind of sad is many times people are real quick to blame God for something bad that happened. Mm -hmm. When they're overlooking something that was very positive that happened, and 9 11 is a good example of that. Yeah. There's a lot of stories of people who, for whatever reason, they didn't die that day. Uh, there's one story of a guy who broke his normal routine, and that day he was the one that went to get donuts. Yeah. And, and I know you love a story where donuts save someone's life. <laughs> That's why I go there at least four days a week. Yeah, that was not a hard thing. It's kind of like there's bound to be something that's going to fall on me again. That's edge. right. But, but he, he went to get donuts, and because of that, he went in the building. Yeah. And there's a lot of stories of, of how people altered their day their, and, and they weren't there or they got out quicker or whatever. And tons and tons of those. And, and, you know, you've got to believe that, that uh, God is working in that bad situation just like he works in something where you would say, well, there's nothing but good here. Yeah. Uh, it's funny. We, we, we'll blame him, but we won't praise him. And that's And, and, and that's I mean, I, I could take the next 30 minutes telling stories of things in Christina's in my life mm -hmm. where it was extremely obvious that 
I mean, it, it, it's one of those things where I would even say that if I shared the stories, you'd go, that's actually miraculous. Yeah. And the short version of one of them is where I made, we made the decision that we were going to retire from banking and go to work in some form of mission work. Yeah. And, I, and I said, I'll call EEM tomorrow and see if they have an interest in me. Yeah. And instead, after two years of me having said something, we got work for them, he calls me and says, Richard, they want to talk to you about coming on staff. When, when you stop and realize, they had no idea I had any interest. Yeah. Except that one guy. And they regretted it ever since. Yeah, they did. And it's all <laughs> the entire <laughs> Now Ukraine's at war, and it's all because Richard was there. <laughs> how, how does something like that happen where yeah. you make the decision one night to give up everything you have to do mission work, and yeah. the next day, they call mission you. work you want, calls you and says, will you come on board? Uh, that's got to be God. That's got to be the spirit working. My short one is, I always had a lot of angst and worry about the fact that I was not exactly the guy who dated a lot of girls. You know, I was not lucky with the ladies uh, and that was the thing that bothered me and worried me a lot and truly truly the the night that i came to terms with it's okay if i am single the rest of my life whatever god's will is and i prayed that prayer and meant that prayer for the first time in my life i met leslie the next day um, and now that may have been a demon working on her life that <laughs> could go either way we'll see well, congratulations, friends. We made it to slide four of um, 14 tonight. So thanks for your help. See you next week.